Hey everyone, so it's Hoth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, we're going to be doing my quarterly book breakdown, where we run through all of the witchcraft and pagan books that I've started, kind of finished and completely finished over the last three months. <music> These videos have ultimately turned into a bit of a series for me. This past three months has actually been pretty good for me. I've tried really hard to start and finish all of the books that I decided to read, and there's two or three that I haven't quite finished yet, but most of them I've done pretty well on. Most of them I've actually finished. So there's eight books in this video. I will leave the names of the book and the author in the description box if you do want to check them out for yourselves, and hopefully this video will help you gain some inspiration. But I do want to say that my opinion on these books is not the be-all and end-all of magical practice, not in the slightest. If you like the books that I've recommended in the past and you like the style of practice that I like, you might find these books could be very useful to you. Just make sure that you do your own research on them, make sure that you figure out whether they're a suitable book for you or not, based on your own research. My opinion on these books is just that, it's mine. If you really love some of these books and I don't like them, then that's fine, it's just we have differing opinions. You know how it is? Everyone's got an opinion, they're not always going to match up, so just bear that in mind going in. I don't really have any great hate for any of these books, it's just that some of them I like far more than some of the others. And with that being said, let's get started. This quarter is actually largely traditional modern witchcraft which I really love. It's my favourite topic to learn about, and you'll find that in a lot of these going forwards, I'm trying to focus on the topics and the books that I really want to read, because I struggle to read books that I'm just not that interested in. So these are mostly traditional modern. Now, you might be a little bit confused as to what that is, but essentially it's taking folk magic, primarily British and English folk magic, and transferring original folk charms, original spells that have been found within written record or found physically in properties and buildings, and making them into something that is very practical to be used in the modern day and age. And I really like being able to incorporate the historic practice of witchcraft within the British Isles into a modern day setting. And for the most part, that's what a lot of these books are based on. So if that's not the kind of thing you're interested in, then I would recommend checking out some of my other quarterly book breakdowns. I will leave the link in the description box and also in the card at the top of the screen somewhere. I'll be honest, I keep forgetting where it is, but it's up there somewhere so that you can check out some of the other quarterly book breakdowns if this one isn't quite for you. The first book we're going to be talking about I've actually spoken about on the last live stream. If you've never seen any of the live streams, I'll leave the link to the playlist down in the description box, but they happen every single month. And on those live streams, I do often give book recommendations, so I'm going to start adding them into these videos as well for anyone who does miss them in the live streams. But this book is called Magical House Protection, The Archaeology of Counter Witchcraft by Brian Hoggard. Now, I am so lucky I managed to get on a talk by Brian Hoggard, and that's how I discovered this book. It was through this fluke chance that I went to this talk, and I'm so glad that I did, because this book is really good. I'm about halfway through it so far, and the reason I didn't power all the way through is because it's very dense. It's the equivalent of a scientific paper in a book. It's a lot, it's like reading a textbook, which is not going to be suitable for everyone, but for some of you, you might really enjoy it. Now, this book itself is on counter witchcraft in the British Isles, and the blurb reads as follows. Belief in magic, and particularly the power of witchcraft, was once a deep and enduring presence in popular culture. People created and concealed many objects to protect themselves from harmful magic. Detailed are the principal forms of magical house protection in Britain and beyond, from the 14th century to the present day. Witch bottles, dried cats, horse skulls, written charms, protection marks, and concealed shoes were all used widely as methods of repelling, diverting, and trapping negative energies. Many of these practices and symbols can be found around the globe, demonstrating the universal nature of efforts by people to protect themselves from witchcraft. And it is so good. Like, it is really, really good. Now, I'm fascinated with folk witchcraft in the modern day. I love learning about folk witchcraft. I love seeing how things develop over time, how the connection with the church has fluctuated and changed, how that was incorporated into magical charms. And this book is all of that good stuff. Essentially, the author has focused on the archaeological finds of these magical items. These are found in historic buildings, in demolition sites, or in renovations. These items are then documented to him, and then he then goes about documenting them in books. And this book is just so good. It covers so many different things. 
in my little notes, I've already given it five stars, by the way, and I haven't even finished reading it because it was so fascinating. Hearing the author speak was so fascinating as well. He's just so knowledgeable on this particular field. I did specifically emphasize in the plus section of my notes that it goes into mummified cats, hidden shoes, protection marks, and more. Even if you know about house protection, it's likely you're going to find out something new. Because although I've spent many, many years looking into folk charms and folk practices in the British Isles, in this book were things that I have never really thought of as being protection. I might have heard of it before, you know, the idea of concealing shoes in buildings is fairly well known if you like historic buildings in this country, but the fact that it has a magical underlying layer to it was something I never realised until I read this book, and it was just eye-opening. It comes with pictures and illustrations of the contents of some of these items, which bottles have been found, and it's documented how they were found, the way up they were, what they were made of, and some of them have even been scanned and tested so that we can figure out what went into a witch bottle 400 years ago. And you might have noticed that I'm very excited about that, because that is so blumming cool. Like, that is amazing. The author does know about witchcraft in the modern day as well. The fact that the author is aware of witchcraft today allows you to see the shift in things over the centuries. And just generally, this book is really, really good. I really, really like it. A few things that I've noted that you should probably be aware of, just in case it's not gonna suit you, is that it does focus on house protection in the British Isles. So that might not be for everyone, particularly if you are wanting folk magic from a different area in the world. World. But it does go over things like the changes in both witchcraft and the church over time and how the influence of the church is going to alter the magical traditions of the people. It covers how the practitioners were perceived within the communities, as well as breaking down all the contents. And honestly, it's just really good. I'm looking forward to finishing it. It is a lot to read, so just bear that in mind, but I think it's well worth it. It was really, really interesting. So next up, we have one that I've actually finished. This is A Spellbook of the Good Witch of Pendle, Reliable Magic for Success in All Circumstances by Joyce Froome. Now this book was one of the first ones I read in this quarter, and it's an interesting one. Now I got this book when I was purchasing from the Witchcraft Museum in Boscastle. I've never had the chance to go, but I did use their online shop because I do like supporting them. I saw this book, thought it was really interesting and decided to get it. And just bear in mind, it is very small. This is the size of the book. It is like a little pocket book and inside it is actually written as though it is a handwritten book. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's written as though it is a handwritten book, which I think is really, really interesting. Now, the main reason I got this book, because many of you will likely be saying, but Hearth, you don't really like spell books. And you're right, I really don't like buying spell books. I don't find them useful in my magical practice. That doesn't mean they aren't going to be in yours, but in mine, I don't find them all that useful. I don't find that I use them that much. But this one really fascinated me because it is all about Pendle. And I was really curious about it because Pendle is one of the most well-known witch trials that occurred within England. It is a horrific story. If you have the chance to learn about it, I would recommend it. I am interested in maybe doing a podcast episode on it if it is the kind of thing that you want to know more about. So just let me know if that's the kind of thing that you would like to see in the podcast next season. But I got this book because I was really interested to learn a little bit more about the witchcraft within Pendle during the time period. And this book isn't that. Forewarning, it just isn't. I did give this book four stars, but for very different reasons than you might think. So the blurb reads as follows. Those who practiced magic often made notebooks. Based on surviving evidence, this unique volume is an imagining of a 17th century spellbook that might have been written by the Lancashire witches of Pendle. It gives an intriguing and entertaining insight into our ancestors' traditional beliefs and is sure to bewitch all readers. Now just bear that wording in mind. It is an imagining of a book that should or could have been created by the witches of the time. That's important because this book actually contains zero information from the Pendle witches. It contains no information from the Pendle witch trials, but it is looking into folk witchcraft in the British Isles, primarily in the Lancashire, England region during the time period that may well have been practiced by people in the area at the time. Now, one thing that is important to remember is that it's quite likely that not a single person who was accused of witchcraft during the Pendle witch trials was actually a witch. Now, of course they could have been, but more often than not, these people were simply innocent in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
So it's a very interesting book and I have a few notes on it, which kind of breaks down why I did give it four stars because I really enjoyed it for what it is. You just need to know about it going in, otherwise you're gonna be disappointed. So it is a speculative book. Despite its name, it's not actually based on the Pendle witches, if there even were any real witches in Pendle. It's entirely based on information from other trials and found charms from other practitioners within the British Isles to create a potential spell book for the area during that time period. If you are looking into accurate history, this is not for you, but if you are looking for an adaptive form of folk magic or traditional witchcraft, this could be useful. I enjoyed the incorporation of different English folk charms into this time period. I use this as a book of enjoyable inspiration for adapting folk charms into my own life. It is a quick and enjoyable read. And that's really why I liked it. I managed to finish this book in maybe an hour. You have so many different charms in here, some of which you are never gonna want to use yourself and are just interesting to read. Others you might really want to use yourself. I'm just flicking through right now and you have everything from not spells, so like witches ladders for the wind. You have information about warts and how people would have got rid of them. And if you liked the video I did on um, folk medicine on my podcast, then this book could be a really fun addition to that. There's definitely a few things in here that I did touch on in that video. You have the idea of certain woods being used, wands being made, different charms, different angels being used. It really is an incorporation of folk charms in the British Isles, primarily in England, into one book. And it is an authentic book. And these charms are authentic. It's not that they have been made up for the purposes of the book. They are real charms that have been found from different areas in the British Isles. And so even if the book itself is an imagining of what a Pendle Witch spell book could have been like, the charms in it do have value in their own right. So that's why I liked this book. It's obviously not gonna be for everyone, but I thought it was a cute, sweet read. And if you do wanna get it from somewhere like the Boss Castle Witchcraft Museum, it helps to support them as well. So next up, we have a book on sea witchcraft, which is a topic I've not really spoken about that much on this channel. This is traditional witchcraft for the seashore. The blurb goes as follows. Although we are an island race, few are fortunate to live near enough to the sea to use the shoreline as a regular magical working area. And yet, for the natural witch, born and bred by the sea, the beach and rocky shore are equally as magical as the inland woods and hills of more traditional approaches to witchcraft. The author takes us on a magical journey along the seashore and reveals how to work with the natural oceanic tides and energies, learn how to harness the powers of the deep, and collect flotsam and jetsam for use as ritual tools a book like no other. So I gave this book three stars, and for me, I didn't enjoy it as much as I was hoping that I would. Now I feel the need to reiterate again, my opinion on a book does not need to sway your opinion on a book. If I don't particularly like a book, it's because of my own magical practice, my own goals, and also what I look for in a book. What I look for in a book might be different than what you look for in a book. So just take my opinion as a pinch of salt. It doesn't mean that I don't like the author. It doesn't mean that I hate the book. It just means that personally, I didn't enjoy this one as much as other people probably would. Just bear that in mind. Make sure you do your own research because this book could be great for lots of you. It just wasn't so great for me. So I have a few things that I really liked about this book. It really emphasizes the dangers of the ocean and how even the most experienced people can get into trouble. Now this one's really significant for me. I spent many years doing life-saving training, like water life-saving training, and the number of people that you hear about getting into terrible situations because they believed that they were a really strong swimmer or they believed that harm could not happen to them because they were too good is actually kind of terrifying. So I really like the fact that the author does emphasize that genuinely even the most experienced people are likely to get into trouble and actually I'd argue that in some cases the most experienced people are more likely to get into trouble because they think that they are immune to danger because of the experience that they have so that was really important to me. I've noted that I really like aspects of the book that focus on history and folklore. I prefer those aspects of the book to the bits that focus on actual magical practice but that's obviously a personal preference. I just prefer the bits that are a bit more education based rather than the bits that are more spell work based but obviously you'll notice that going forwards I typically tend to prefer books that are education over spell books that's just a personal preference the book does focus primarily on elemental magic being used on the seashore and so if elemental magic isn't for you you might not find this book entirely suitable but it is an interesting read 
It talks about how the spells we create for ourselves are more powerful than those we might use out of books, which I think is very accurate, and I really like it when authors emphasise this. And then the spells at the end are actually pretty good, and you can adapt them pretty easily for your own magical practice, which is really useful, especially if you aren't used to working with sea witchcraft in any way. It can be good to have that basis to build on, so that you already kind of know what you're getting into. Now those were the bits that I really liked about this book. Um, there were others that I, I really didn't, but obviously that's personal preference. There are a few things that I found rather confusing in that the book is about traditional witchcraft, but it emphasises that you shouldn't be doing any negative workings, even though historically we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents showing that magical practitioners did do both cursing and curing. It was very common and actually it was the normal for the practices within traditional witchcraft. So it seems a little counterintuitive to me that it would be pushed down in this book and minimized as something that you shouldn't be doing. There is a section on familiars as well as astral projection and guardian spirits, but I found all of them very counterintuitive and very confusing, especially if you are not used to doing astral projection, if you aren't used to working with spirits. I have found them to be rather confusing, and if I have found them rather confusing, I would reckon that a beginner would also find them very confusing, especially when they contradict lots of other work that is out there on the subject, and not necessarily in a good way. So just bear that in mind. The book has a lot of really good things in it. It has a lot of positive merits. It has things in the book that I personally don't like. So just make sure that you do your research. Same with every book on this list to make sure that it's right for you. But if you are interested in traditional witchcraft on the seashore, it could be well worth checking out. It has information on how to work with different tidal energies, which I thought was really cool. Talking about high tide and low tide and the connection with these with your magical practice. And so some of the stuff in this book could be incredibly useful to someone who is looking into traditional sea witchcraft. So just bear all that in mind. Okay, next. The next book is one that I actually haven't finished yet, and that is The Witch's Ointment, The Secret History of Psychedelic Magic. Now, this is one that I have found very difficult to read. I am about halfway through. I have been reading it for weeks and weeks and weeks. I am just really struggling because it is so unbelievably wordy. I have never, don't think I've ever read a book that has so many unnecessary words in it. Now, this is not me saying that the book is bad. The book is actually incredibly fascinating. It's on a subject that is often very heavily overlooked by the magical community. That is the emphasis of witches' ointments within folk practice. However, if you don't like a lot of words, if you are dyslexic, if you struggle with reading, this one is going to be difficult. And I will read the blurb. But brace yourself, because I have read this blurb twice now, and I still cannot wrap my head around some of the words. So <laughs> just bear that in mind. Be gentle on me. I'm trying. It's a, it's a ridiculously long blurb, and it gives you an insight into how wordy the book itself actually is. So the blurb goes as follows. An exploration of the historic origins of the witch's ointment and medieval hallucinogenic drug practices based on the earliest sources. It details how early modern theologians demonise psychedelic folk magic into witch's ointments, shares dozens of psychoactive formulas and recipes gleaned from rare manuscripts from university collections all over the world, as well as the practices of magical incantations necessary for their preparation, examines the practices of medieval witches who used hallucinogenic drugs in their love potions and herbal preparations. In the medieval period, preparations with hallucinogenic herbs were part of the practice of beneficium or poison magic. This collection of magical arts used poisons, herbs, and rituals to bewitch, heal, prophecy, infect, and murder. In the form of psychomagical ointments, poison magic could trigger powerful hallucinations and surrealistic dreams that enable direct experience with the divine. Smeared on the skin, these entheogenic ointments were said to enable witches to commune with various local goddesses, bastardised by the church as trips to the Sabbath, clandestine meetings with Satan to learn magic and participate in demonic orgies, examining trial records and the pharmacopoeia of witches, alchemists, folk healers and heretics in the 15th century, the author details how a range of ideas, from folk drugs to ecclesiastical fears over medicine women, merged to form the classical witch stereotype, and what history has called the witch's ointment. 
He shares dozens of psychoactive formulas and recipes gleaned from rare manuscripts from university collections from all over the world, as well as the practices and magical incantations necessary for their preparation. He explores the connections between the witch's ointment and spells for shapeshifting, spirit travel, and bewitching magic. He examines the practices of some Renaissance magicians who inhaled powerful drugs to communicate with spirits, and of Italian folk witches who used hallucinogenic drugs in their love potions and herbal preparations, to others who used drug ointments to imagine themselves transforming into a cat. Exploring the untold history of the witch's ointment and medieval hallucinogen use, the author reveals how the church transformed folk drug practices, specifically entheogenic ones, into satanic experiences. I'm gonna need a minute. Oh my god. <laughs> That is the wordiest blurb I have ever read. And the fact that it repeats itself three times should give you an idea of what this book is like. It contains so many words. Um, it is fascinating, however. It is truly, truly interesting. It covers so much historic information and it really does bring to light the idea that a lot of what we believe about witchcraft came from medieval writings by the church and ultimately that sways it because we perceive the world through the lens of our religion and if you were a member of the church during the medieval period it very much swayed how you were writing and documenting the practices of these witches so-called witches that you were perceiving to be around you and so it's a really interesting look about how these things that we see as being so characteristic of witches during this period could actually simply be a demonization of very basic folk practices using entheogenic herbs and how they were demonized by the church. And even just saying those words makes my head kind of hurt and I kind of can't remember half of the things that I just said. This book kind of hurts my brain. Is it fascinating? Yes. Might you struggle with it if you don't find reading easy? Yes, because I am struggling with it. My little dyslexic brain is struggling. So just bear that in mind. I'm going to keep plodding away at it. I'm determined to finish it. But if this is the kind of thing you're after, if you really like looking into the use of entheogenic herbs, if you really like the use and the, the research behind Beneficia, this could be a good book for you. Okay, next. Now, I know I said I don't really like spell books and I'll stand by it. I don't. However, this is a book that I did touch on in the last quarterly book breakdown. I will link it in the description box if you haven't seen that. And I've kept reading it. Now, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm really liking it. This is Barbarous Words. Now, some of you sent me messages after the last quarterly book breakdown to tell me how much you also loved this book. It is genuinely so good. I have this on Kindle Unlimited. It's available on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, please, Check this one out if you like British folk magic. It's really, really, really good. Now, I'm not going to go over the blurb again or anything that I spoke about in the last video, but I will just very briefly explain that this book touches on folk magic charms and spells that have been discovered in the early modern period. That being the time period where most magical traditions have been retained from because we have physical documentation of them existing. Most of the folk charms from this time period were Christianized due to the requirement by the church. And so a lot of the time you do find that traditional witchcraft from this time period has a very strong Christian basis. This book contains lots of workings that have a Christian basis. Now, I personally am not a Christian witch, so I adapt these workings to suit my practice. You can very easily do that. If you are a Christian witch, however, you could take these workings straight from this book into your magical practice and they would probably work amazingly. Now, I have read a lot at this point. And from the last time that I spoke about this, we have gone over fetches and familiars, maintaining pacts with them and the importance of the maintenance of these pacts for their success. Can we just say hell yeah to that? Because so many books that talk about familiars do not talk about the requirement for respect. They do not talk about the requirement of maintaining the agreements and the pact that you have created with the spirit in question. It differentiates the difference between a fetch and a familiar. Hell yes, this book contains so much information that other books simply miss because they aren't entertaining enough or they don't fit in with the modern style of witchcraft. 
It covers working with the fair folk, which is really well done, has very detailed descriptions of what working with the fey folk can be like, as well as offerings that you might want to give and the style of workings that you might want to do generally. It's a really short chapter, but is really efficient. It has a section on working with the known and the unknown dead, including ancestors, which is really good and useful. It talks about how familiar spirits are not pets and how they are spirits that need to be treated with respect. Yes! And then I literally say in my notes, quote, Joking aside, this book is one of the best descriptions of a spirit contract in terms of a familiar that I have ever seen. It is phenomenal and is accurate to what familiars are actually like. End quote. As you can see, I was very happy on the chapter with familiars. It then covers servitors, how they are made, how you destroy them, what are they for, how to create spirit houses. It has an entire chapter on protection spells and more negative workings in accordance to the evidence that has been found, some of which I have actually noted in my Book of Shadows because they were so good. And if you know me, you know that that's quite rare. And then I do note that this isn't a book of self-help. It's a book on actual magical practice. And I think it's really important to note here that modern witchcraft books, the books that you kind of see readily available today in shops, they typically fall into one of two categories. They are either self-help books that are wrapped in a magical package. They are meditation books. They are relaxation books. They are designed to help you with your self-confidence and self-help wrapped in witchcraft. That's one form of magical practice. And it's a very valid form of magical practice. There's the other form of magical practice, which is primarily what I focus on, which is witchcraft that is folk traditional witchcraft in the modern age. It works with spirits. It's more gruesome in a way. It is more traditional folk magic, not just self-help wrapped in a magical packaging. If you are looking for the self-help style of books, this spell book is not going to be for you. You're actually probably going to really dislike it because it doesn't contain the kind of self-help kind of spells, the personal spells that you're going to see in more modern spell books. This is very much a nitty gritty kind of spell book based on historical documents of spells that have been found. So just bear that in mind, if you are not after the nitty gritty stuff, this one probably isn't going to be for you. But for some people, it very well might be. I really love this book. And I will hopefully have finished it by the time I see everyone next. It's just that because it is a spell book, I tend to not spend hours of my evening reading it, I will like, come on, read a few spells, go on to something else, come on, read a few spells, go on to something else. Otherwise, you find yourself just going through spell after spell after spell after spell that you just don't need. So it's taking me a little bit longer, but it is really, really good. So next up, we have Welsh Witchcraft, A Guide to the Spirits, Law and Magic of Wales. Now, this is a book that I picked up a few months ago. The book itself is pretty enjoyable. The blurb goes as follows. A new approach to witchcraft based on Welsh traditions. Enter a world of sacred lakes, healing herbs, spectral hounds and the mighty red dragon. Written by a Welsh practitioner, this inspiring book shares the magical traditions of Wales, including fairies, folklore and charms. With dozens of hands-on activities, Mara Sterling shows you how you can incorporate Welsh and Celtic folk magic into your modern witchcraft practices with exercises for celebrating those who came before, protecting against adversity, changing the weather and more. You'll also discover the methods for honouring the land and ways to connect with Ceredwen, Rhiannon and other deities. Welsh witchcraft invites you to explore this country's rich heritage and use it to empower your spirituality. Now I gave this book four stars. I did really like it. The one thing I will say is that if you know anything about Welsh mythology, Welsh tradition or Wales as a whole, you will likely find that this book might cover information that you already know. Now bear in mind here, I did spend several years living in North Wales and I did spend a lot of time researching Welsh mythology. One of my deities is Ceredwen and so therefore going into this book, I already knew a fair amount about Welsh mythology, Welsh history, and I knew that going in. So for me, this book contained a lot of information that I already knew. But if you are really wanting to learn about Welsh mythology, Welsh tradition, Welsh spells, the Welsh landscape, this book is really fascinating and it's really nice getting a book on Welsh tradition because it's something that is so overlooked. I spent many years looking for a book like this and couldn't find it, so I had to gain the information from lots of smaller sources. So to have one book with all of this information put into it was really, really refreshing to see. But obviously, if you know anything about Welsh mythology, Welsh tradition, 
you're likely going to find it a little bit repetitive to what you already know. But this book is primarily aimed at people who really don't know that much and therefore it could be a really good book. Now some of the things that I did say about it is that it's modern traditional witchcraft, which I really enjoy. It looks into the folk magic practices that have been discovered and adapts them into the modern day. And there are several spells in this book that I have actually added and adapted into my Book of Shadows. And that's quite unusual. You wouldn't think it given the fact that I've said that several times today, but for me that is actually pretty unusual. So it does contain some really good spells. There's an emphasis on the need to adapt workings to suit you, which I really like, and it focuses on fey folk mythologies, festivals, plants, etc. And I really, really liked that. The only downside that I had was it's a little bit repetitive, especially if you do know information about Wales. But generally, if you're after a book like this, if you want to learn about your Welsh heritage, if you want to learn a little bit about Wales, as well as the magical traditions that go behind it, it was a really enjoyable book. It was really good. And I liked reading it. It was a very comfortable read. So I would recommend this one. This one was pretty good. And then the last book on this list is probably my favourite of this entire quarter. So I did save the best to last. And that is A Broom at Midnight, 13 Gates of Witchcraft by Spirit Flight by Roger J. Horn. Now, some of you will likely recognise that author's name from another of my favourite books, which is Folk Witchcraft. I love, love this book. This book is so, so good. And this one is no different. Now, this book really focuses on spirit flight, on astral projection, and on utilising that within magical traditions. And it is a really interesting read. I think I read it in like a few days. Like I think I sat down and over the course of like two days, I just read the entire book. So the blurb goes as follows. Preserved in medieval and early modern witch lore, the image of the witch embarking upon flight has become iconic from a historic and folkloric perspective. In the accounts of previous ages, however, it was commonly understood that witches flew in spirit form rather than corporeal form, leaving the physical body behind as the practitioner voyaged onto a journey into the other world to procure knowledge, learn charms, visit boon and bane upon others, and attend the spiritual gatherings of the witch's sabbat. In this unique offering, the author organises the lore and charms of the transvective arts around 13 central lessons and approaches in methodology acting as gates through which the practitioner may cross. Some approaches offered here may be familiar to folk and traditional witches, such as via beneficium, by way of poison, or via aquarium, by way of steed, while others, by way of image or by way of storm, draw on historic lore and charms in order to innovate upon old craft while maintaining the spirit that flavours these beloved arts. By mastering the often overlooked work of sabbatic ecstasis, the witch is brought into direct contact with familial spirits, powers of the land and of ancestry, and with the primal sources of witchcraft itself, yielding an inexhaustible and ever unfolding curriculum of art magical. And I loved this. I really love this. I gave this four and a half stars. Okay, fine. It probably isn't the best book of this set, but it was by far the most enjoyable to read. I'm just realizing I didn't give it five stars. So I'm going to take back the original thing that I said, but it was probably the most enjoyable read of all of them because it's something that is so rarely touched on. It is something that is so rarely found. And so my brief breakdown goes as follows. It is a combination of magical practice and historic information written by a practitioner for a practitioner, making it a great blend of folk magic and history in a practical application. This is something that I find really hard to come by. It's why I love Gemma Gary's work because Gemma Gary writes from a practitioner's perspective for a practitioner. And so their work is really good. This book is the same. It is written by a practitioner for a practitioner, but it includes so much historic information, so much folk magic that we can incorporate into our practice. It's very easy to add it into your practice. It's much harder when you have a book that's written by a historian and you're attempting to adapt it into your magical practice versus a book that's written by a practitioner for a practitioner. It just makes it so much easier in this way. It covers familial spirits. Spirits. Not animals. Spirits. It covers familial spirits and it does it really well. It goes over what they are, how to work with them and how to do so respectfully and safely. Yes! It focuses on spirit flight in many forms, including via shadows, fire and repetition, among others. 
All rituals in the book are repeated at the end, so you don't have to sift through the entire book after the fact to get to the ritual you want. They're all found at the end in even more detail, which is phenomenal. The rituals are pretty accessible for everyone and they are relatively easy to follow. Now there are a few downsides to it. The main negative for me is that it doesn't go into spirit flight or astral projection in any deep way. So it talks about the different ways that you can undertake it, but it doesn't really tell you how to get to the point of undertaking it. And it also doesn't talk too much about how it's going to feel. Now this in itself might not be a problem if you have experienced astral projection or spirit flight before, but if you haven't, it might be a little bit difficult to comprehend. Oftentimes it will talk about the way that you would undertake take it, but it doesn't tell you how you get to the point of that happening or how it's meant to make you feel or just how it feels generally. And so a lot of beginners might find that they feel like they're not doing it properly when really it's just they haven't got to that point where they can do it easily. And the other thing that I just want to touch on is that this isn't really a book that I would recommend for a straight up beginner. It does just focus on spirit flight, which I really love because I don't need the beginner bits of the books that contain the beginner bits. But if you are very much a beginner, I would say look into beginner witchcraft books and then get this book separately as an addition. Don't use this as a substitution. But generally, this book is so good and I'm actually planning on getting the rest of Roger J. Horn's works. I already have this one. I'm planning on getting far more because I really love the style of writing. It's definitely the kind of thing that I think works really well for me personally. I find that it's wordy without being difficult. It covers the things I need it to without taking me too long to read. There's definitely a balance that I have to find between something that's heavily academic based that I'm gonna really struggle reading and something that's far too simplistic. And I find that this book really walked that path super effectively. So yeah, those are all of the books that I started, kind of finished and completely finished over the last three months. It was probably a very long video. I'm really sorry about that. I'm hoping to have put timestamps down in the description box so that you can skip to the books that you are interested in. But if you did get all the way through this list of books, are there any books in this list that you are particularly interested in? Have you read any of them yourself? And what were your opinions on them? Please let me know in the comment section because it not only helps me, but it also helps lots of other people as well. Because as many the opinions in this video are just mine. So if you do have a differing opinion on a particular book or you have different things you want to add into the conversation, please do so in the comment section so that other people can figure out whether a book is right for them or not. If you did enjoy this video, feel free to give it a like. It really means so much to me. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, or just want to chit chat with the community, feel free to post a comment down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. Wow, that is a mouthful. I hope you're all staying safe. I hope you have a marvelous magical day and I will see you in the next video. Bye. I literally have no idea how that's been how long that that's been off for. My camera shut off partway through that. And I was reading the blurb to the um the the one with the really long blurb and it shut off and I I have no idea when it shut off so I'm just desperately hoping that it didn't shut off like when I needed it on that would be a disaster. So I'm going to go check that now. And <laughs> let's see, let's see if that's all right. I really, really hope it is. Okay, bye. <laughs>